Hi there, my name is Dr. Michael Vallis. I'm a health psychologist from Tallahassee University in Halifax, and I've spent most of my career working in diabetes management. I've been associated with diabetes management services, seeing individuals living with type 1 and type 2 diabetes for quite a few years. Also been involved with Diabetes Canada on their guidelines, and I do research in this area primarily around coping and uh, motivation for management of uh, chronic conditions such as diabetes. I've been asked to make some comments about uh, not the medical management of type 1 diabetes, but actually the psychological experience of living with diabetes. In particular, I've been asked to talk about concepts including things like burnout and diabetes distress. And one question that's been asked is, well, what's the difference between these? And I think the best way to appreciate that is to see it in sort of historical context. And so for a long time in diabetes, we weren't, we weren't very sensitive, actually, to the lived experience of what the disease was like. Disease-based distress, we call this. We had a language in which we would look at individuals living with diabetes and think, well, maybe they're depressed or maybe they're anxious. And we would use the language of, of mental health disorders or what's called psychopathology. And then we realized that this was not what individuals were experiencing. And so the concept of burnout kind of came from that context of what it wasn't. As we've advanced our understanding of the lived experience of diabetes, we've become a bit more clear on how to understand that psychological experience. And this is now what we would label as diabetes distress, the distress associated with living with the condition. And I find that when you're working with people, a very useful question to ask somebody who's presenting with distress is the following question. If you did not have diabetes, would you be experiencing this? And if the person says, oh, this has got nothing to do with my diabetes, it's probably not diabetes distress. But as you reflect on that question, many of you will say, my issues are because I live with diabetes and the fear of hypoglycemia or social aspects of living with the disease or just the, the ongoing effort that's required to keep this disease under control. And so to the extent that the disease, the descent, to the extent that the diabetes is causing the distress, this is what the concept of diabetes distress really means. It's a problem. It's important because of how common it is and how it can interfere with quality of life and even with diabetes care. I was part of an international study called the Diabetes Attitudes, Wishes and Needs study. And this was actually a 16 country study looking at what the experience of individuals with diabetes, family members and healthcare providers. And we actually uncovered that with type 1 diabetes, about 53% of individuals experienced diabetes distress. When we had a look at the data and we just simply asked, you know, to what percentage of the population experiences some negative impact of living with type 1 diabetes, and that was 83%. And even family members, 54% indicated that their lives were negatively impacted by type 1 diabetes. So we see this as a, as a big issue that needs to be addressed. And when you look at diabetes distress, I've always been very influenced by uh, a perspective in which we kind of break down the general distress category into different aspects. And I kind of like this because it, it actually makes really good sense. So the four aspects that we like to think about are, first of all, just the emotional burden of living with diabetes. How heavy is this disease for you? It varies over time. But it's useful to think about that emotional burden because that's something that we want to be sensitive to and want to support individuals in. The second aspect of diabetes distress is really what we call regimen distress, but it's all the work of diabetes and all that comes with that. Here's where you would start to experience the issues around hypoglycemia concerns or eating related concerns. And this, of course, again, varies over time. That kind of talks about specifically the disease. But then equally important is how you live with this disease in the context of your life. And so the other two parts of diabetes distress are what we call family and social support distress. How do you navigate the world living with type 1 diabetes in terms of your relationship with other people? And where are the sources of distress that are associated with that? 
And then the last aspect, actually one that I really like to focus on because I spend a lot of my time with my medical colleagues on this issue, is what we call provider-based distress, the extent to which you may feel either supported or judged by the healthcare provider. This is also a major issue. So when we look at diabetes distress, I think it becomes a very relevant concept because it normalizes the experience of the condition and it also provides a context to allow us to understand that these burdens vary over time depending on what's going on in your life, depending on what is happening with your disease, depending on the management strategies and the success of all of those efforts on your diabetes control, this will impact the emotional burden, the stress associated with the work of diabetes and the relation aspects of diabetes, both with providers, family and friends. An important question to address with regard to distress is, is how do you know it's too intense? My first statement here is to think about how really quality of life reflects a balance between stresses and joys, what we call distress and well-being. And so the first thing to, to encourage you to focus in on is to make sure that you are uh, living as fully as you can. So, so what can you do to enhance your well-being? And to a great extent, it's that balance that determines how well a person functions vis-a-vis their quality of life. The concerns around when is it too much? When might I benefit from seeking help? And the two things to pay attention to here are the intensity, how strong is that distress? Is it how overwhelming is it? And the extent to which it interferes with your ability to function. I like to use the following question because it just makes perfect sense. Question is how heavy, if you think about your life in the last month, let's say, how heavy has diabetes been for you? If it was a weight, that you were carrying in a backpack. How heavy would it be? One pound loaf of bread, five pound sack of potatoes, 50 pound iron anvil, or a two ton truck? I like that question because it just makes perfect sense and it gives you an idea of how heavy it is. And then the degree of interference. You can understand this experience by reflecting on your own, but also it can be useful to ask a trusted other, someone who you feel close to, who knows you well, how they feel that you're doing. And if you feel that you're getting close to those limits, that is intensity and interference, then this is when you might want to seek help. And we are doing more and more work in diabetes in Canada to address the psychological aspects of living with diabetes. So reach out to a care team, family physician, whomever you have in your life to support you in the management piece. There was a second uh, aspect of this issue around distress that I was asked to talk about, and that is the the pandemic and what effect the pandemic has had really on all of us. And we know, for instance, that people, um, they become routined. So you have a certain pattern to your life. Perhaps you like to pick up your coffee from a particular place, made a particular way on your way to work or what have you. We have routines. These routines kind of anchor us in our life. And the pandemic has just really interfered with all of those. So it's pretty fair to say that this pandemic has had a strong, strong impact on increasing the stress that we experience in our lives and therefore the distress that we would experience. And there's something about stress that we know as stress goes up in a person's life, self-care goes down. This is just the natural response that we have. And so it's super important to be thinking about how are we managing the stress and remember, Life is stressful. If you have type 1 diabetes, there's another layer of stress that goes on top of that. And now living through the pandemic adds to that layer. So it's important to be mindful of that level of stress because stress management, stress reduction, it can be very, very useful in terms of keeping that in check. And a concept that we use in psychology is called build and burden. In other words, it can be sort of these little things that kind of cause some distress. And if that then is added to, that is added to, that is added to. This is where the expression, the straw that broke the camel's back comes from. It's that just a little bit extra that on top of what's there is overwhelming. And I like to think about stress management as a way of, of kind of letting go of that stress. And so it avoids the built in burden because you might have a stress, you manage it, you kind of reduce it, put it in its place, 
kind of clear the decks and on you can go. And so this concept can be very useful. And when it comes to living in the pandemic, this becomes really important because of what we know about basic psychology. And what I mean by that is the following. The experience of loss results in the feeling of sadness. The experience of threat results in the feeling of anxiousness. And the experience of, of injustice results in the feeling of anger. And so reflect on the pandemic. Has there been any loss? Has there been any threat? Do you experience any injustice? And of course, we see that the answer to all of those questions is absolutely. And this then helps us to appreciate the additional stress in our life that the pandemic has uh, produced. And I want to normalize that. That's not a problem. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of being human and functioning. And so the strategies that we would encourage you to engage in would be what we call stress reduction strategies. And what we know about stress reduction strategies are the following. First, one size does not fit all. Find the strategy that works for you. What I like to think about is if you're considering a stress management strategy, I'd first ask you to, to think about it in the following manner. One is, um, which strategy interests you? Those that interest you, give them a try. When you try them, are you glad you did? And when you try them, do you want to do them again? And that's a useful guide to kind of um, finding the, the sort of first approach to stress management. My second comment about stress management st strategies in general is that they are additive. The more, the better. And so trying to think about, um, you know, when I give you a list of the stress management um, styles, you'll say, oh, this is what I already do, which is great. Can you do more of it? How can you package it so that it's easier for you to access? But also, if you wouldn't mind, think about how you could try new strategies so you can actually add to them, because the more you do, the more they help. So with that being in mind, I'd just like to touch on what the five strategies are. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what the uh, stress reduction method is. The first is what we call physical calming. So any activity that allows you to kind of achieve a calm, peaceful, quiet, reflective experience. It could be meditation. It could be mindfulness. It could be Tai Chi. It could be, um, you know, writing poetry, whatever you would do that would allow you to kind of have calm, peaceful moments. The second is physical discharge, burning off the stress. So any type of physical activity that you would engage in that would allow you to feel that stress be discharged. Um, the third is what we call emotional expression. Don't keep your feelings bottled up. Find a way of expressing yourself. Doesn't have to be in words. Could be with art, could be with music, could be any type of creativity that allows you to express yourself. The fourth strategy is what we call social support. In that we know that having important connections with others is extremely valuable in managing stress. And then the fifth strategy is we call sort of acceptance-based, which is, it's kind of like, you know, what are the things that you can control in your life and those things you can work to, uh, to control, but what are the things that you can't control? And having an attitude of acceptance when is, is actually really valuable. So those five coping strategies can be useful to you as you manage diabetes, as you manage the pandemic. And I really believe that we'll see in the next number of years an increased focus on stress management because of the just the, uh, the broad effect that the pandemic has had on increasing people's stress. So thank you for the opportunity to make these comments and I wish you the best of luck.